Tracy, thanks for thanks for having me. Um, first and foremost, I, I do appreciate everybody's time. Uh, I was supposed to be doing this at the factory. Unfortunately, I'm doing it at home, so I've got a little assistant here. I'm gonna do everything I can to make sure that that individual back there stays quiet. So uh, I do apologize profusely in advance in, in the event that that happens. But again, I appreciate everybody taking the time during lunch, uh, especially right before this holiday season to, to jump on and, and, uh, and, and hopefully learn something about desiccant dehumidifiers. So with that being said, I'll, I'll share my screen. And if you guys have any questions, I know that um, I'm open to you having them uh, coming right as I'm presenting. But if you want to hold them to the end, that's fine as well. I assume you guys can see my screen. Is that accurate? Yeah, that looks good. OK, thank you. So again, introduction to innovative air technologies, a little bit of education on desiccant dehumidifiers and basically how they're applied to our industries. Um, today's review, we're going to be talking about our products, our applications, our technologies. We're going to get a little bit of a, I'm not going to say a deep dive, but we're going to dive into the psychometric chart and, and see where desiccant dehumidifiers kind of benefit or you know where they live. It's a little bit of a spoiler alert. It's definitely on the lower end of the psychometric chart. Um, we're going to discuss markets as as Tracy was mentioning, the way manufacturing is coming back to the states, there is such a big push over the last decade um, to understand how dry air benefits a lot of these industries. And we'll, and we'll talk about that. And then finally, we'll talk about uh, our support of Holden, which therefore supports uh, you, the engineer, and, and therefore as a team, we can support the end customer. Do a brief history on innovative air technologies. Uh, I don't want to harp on this too much because we do have a limited time, but I started innovative air technologies back in 2001. Uh, I'm kind of a second generation demodification specialist, if you will. Uh, my father has been in the business for upwards of 50 years. He used to be the vice pres president of Briar back in the late 60s. Um, our vision is to enrich the lives of people that we that we come in contact with. And it seems kind of cliche, but if we can solve our customers' problems, uh, we're making their lives better. And we do that through our customers. We want to make sure our vendors, our reps, uh, engineers as yourself, we want to make your life better by you working with us. Quick comment on the, the rep strategy. We used to, we've done zero marketing probably over the last 19 to 20 years of our existence. Uh, we realized there's a natural organic ceiling to that. So we moved to a more rep based strategy in 20, 2018. And so that's where partnering with someone like Holden uh, allows us to extend our reach into the industry and enrich more people's lives. And then finally, uh, with regards to our history, uh, we built a new facility that allowed us to, to expand and be able to support the growth that we expect to come here in the next, you know, in the coming years. Now that that's over, let's get to the, uh, to the nitty gritty details of what we do. Um, everybody has gotten these silica gel packets that say silica gel do not eat. Um, whether it's in your briefcase or your purse or uh, electronics, the whole concept of these silica gel beads is to absorb moisture. Um, why they are in your commodities, it's to keep them dry from the time it's manufactured overseas until the time it arrives at your doorstep. Um, silica gel, um, desiccant dehumidifiers use silica gel. Uh, that silica gel has a very high affinity for water vapor. Um, it, it wants to, uh, to attract that, that water to it, um, and it, it, it does so, and we use them in applications typically below 45 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, refrigeration does a pretty fantastic job in, in, in environments above 45 degree dew points, so the bulk of what we'll be talking about today is dew points typically 40 degrees and below. Basic principles to a desiccant dehumidifier. 
I always tell people, if you can get a number of items to happen concurrently, you're going to get dry air from a desiccant dehumidifier. Um, that, that silica gel is impregnated into a media, which allows air to go across it. Um, you filter it. The simplest way I describe desiccant also is it's a filter. It's designed to filter out moisture. Um, however, if you don't have filters ahead of the desiccant wheel, it will act as a primary filter. The downside to that is once it starts filtering out other contaminants, you have the, you know, you start losing the capacity of the silica gel. So we filter it, we pull air across it, and then we actually heat up the secondary airstream, which is what we call the reactivation airstream, um, to anywhere from probably 170 degrees up to roughly 285 degrees. So the moisture that's collected in the desiccant wheel gets rotated over to the reactivation airstream. And once it's pulled into that reactivation airstream and it's hit with that 200 to 285 degrees temperature, it effectively doesn't like it. It lets go of the moisture and that moisture is dumped outside through the reactivation outlet. So it's a constant adsorption process. And then as it rotates into the, to the reactivation, it's a, it's a constant desorption. So you're constantly collecting moisture in the wheel. And as you're collecting it, you're at the same time, you're driving off the moisture that it's collected. With regards to strategies, on desiccant dehumidifiers, there's two main ones. There's room dehumidification and there's process dehumidification. So we've got room, which is what you would typically be used to. It's a more of a recirculated system. It's the most efficient out of the two or it's the more efficient out of the two uh, strategies. The room is, is you're maintaining a condition in a specific space whether it's a lab or whether it's a clean room or, or a library or something like that, you actually have a, a specific room that's, you need the dryer in the space. Um, when you are engineering, when you're designing the systems, you must focus on the internal room loads. Uh, I always describe room loads like you're in a sinking, you're in a sinking ship or you're in a sinking rowboat You've got a hole in that boat, water is coming into that boat, AKA your room, through door openings, through people. And we need to design a dehumidifier that can remove the moisture quick, quicker than it actually comes into the, to the room. The second strategy is more of a process. Um, you guys are, you guys use the term DOAS or a single pass or outside air systems. Uh, those applications are more where you're not necessarily dehumidifying a specific space, if you will, but more or less you're either blanketing a process like conveying uh, raw materials, whether it be plastics or sugar or uh, hygroscopic foodstuffs, um, all the way down to explosives where you couldn't actually return that explosive dust back to the inlet of the dehumidifier. Um, in this situation, you don't have to run a room load. Uh, typically the customer will tell you, Hey, I've got a 1700 CFM PD blower that I need to, you know, dry my sugar from the time it's unloaded off of a truck. So those are the two main strategies for the desiccant dehumidifier. Again, more of a recirculated system from a room design or more of a process where it's more DOAS based or you're taking all outside air. And you're not necessarily, um, not necessarily uh, maintaining humidity in a space. It's more or less you're you're conveying it or you're dumping it over a, a certain area. Uh, let's dive a little bit into the desiccant versus refrigeration on the psych psychometric chart. Uh, hopefully, you guys are well versed on on this chart. You've got your dry bulb, which is your vertical lines. Uh, you've got your horizontal lines, which are more your absolute, whether it's in dew point or grains per pound. Then you've got your, your curve lines, which is your relative humidity. And then finally, you've got your angled uh, wet bulb 
lines. I was talking to Tracy earlier and uh, within the psychometric chart, we've got two areas. We've got the higher level, which I was talking about earlier with, with regards to refrigeration, it does a fairly, fairly efficient job at removing moisture. So whether you're in an office environment or, uh, you know, a conditioned lab, air conditioning does a, a fairly good job down to about that 40, 45 to 50 degree dew point. Um, at that, you know, 45 degree dew point, desiccant really takes over. Desiccant is unbelievably efficient at removing moisture when you're talking about dew points that are below 40. Um, there have been discussions in the past about it being a competing technology. Uh, we don't look at it like that. Uh, a lot of the times we actually use refrigerant as a supplementary or a complementary technology to our desiccant dehumidifiers. So we'll get into that here in a, here in a second. Any, any questions so far? I'd like to pause just for a, a minute or two and, and allow you guys to ask any questions. There's none in the queue right now. Okay, thank you. So moving on, I want to I want to give you guys a an example of if we were to take a DOAS system, um, and let's just say since we're from you know most of us are from Georgia, uh, we've got Ambient in Atlanta, the one percent or the 0.4 percent ash ray. You guys are relatively happy with a 95 degrees dry bulb, but a 78 degree wet bulb. Let's say the customer requires us to give them a 55 degree temperature at a 15% relative humidity condition. So if you look at this, you carry this over to the right and you run into the humidity ratio on the right side, you know, you're talking maybe eight, nine grains per pound. Let's talk about how we're going to achieve that. Um, if you were to go through a desiccant right out of the gate from a 95, 78 wet bulb, you're going to go down, which you're gonna be removing moisture, but you're gonna to go to the right. The byproduct of any dry desiccant dehumidifier is sensible heat. So we use a rule of thumb, if you wanna write this down. Rule of thumb is you're going to get roughly a 40 grain differential drop and you're gonna get it roughly the same 40, but you're gonna get a 40 degree sensible heat rise off of it. Um, again, that's a rule of thumb. There's obviously, there's areas outside of that scenario, um, but typically I'd say roughly a 40 degree grain drop and a 40 degree temperature rise. So if I was to go in at 95 at 78 wet bulb, which is about 118 grains per pound, I'd come off at about 135 degrees, which is outside of this chart, at you know maybe only a 78, 78 grains. So I, you know if I'm out here, I'm not going to be able to make it. So what we do is we pre-cool it, we cool it down to the saturation mark, 100% humidity, maybe cool it down to 50 degrees Fahrenheit. As you can tell, I still can't get there. The reason I can't get there any further is the freezing point of water, right? The freezing point of water being 32 degrees Fahrenheit, we just can't get down that low. So we pre-cool to 50, we stop there, then we run the, the air through the desiccant dehumidifier. Again, you're gonna see about a 40 degree temperature rise. Um, 50 degrees, you're gonna end up around 95, 96 degrees at, again, your dew point that you're looking for that, that nine, 10 degree dew point. Well, guess what? The byproduct of that is heat. So instead of being able to come directly down, now we've gone too far over on the heat side. So what we're gonna do is we're going to then post cool it down to the temperature of what the customer needs. In this case, 50 degrees Fahrenheit. This is one of those scenarios where we're adding pre-cooling to it uh, because of ambient conditions and we're adding post-cooling uh, to it to bring the sensible temperature down to what the customer needs. There's, I would say, almost an infinite number of possibilities, which we'll get into briefly after we talk about our products, of how to apply 
these components and how to apply these desk and dehumidifiers to different applications. Uh, if there's no other questions, I'd like to talk about our three main dehumidifier products. The first one is our compact series. It's a stainless steel product, about 75 CFM. We've got four main models. We've got a 75 CFM, a 150 CFM, a 300 CFM, and we just recently, within the last month, released a 600 CFM model. Um, these are all stainless steel. They're perfect for like walk-in environmental rooms, um, for laboratories where you've already controlled the temperature and all you need is just a basic desiccant dehumidifier like, like, you like I showed you earlier in the, uh, in the slide that had the desiccant wheel, the filters, the heater, and the fans. That's exactly what this compact series is. It's a 75 to 600 CFM standalone dehumidifier. Well, one great benefit to these, they're in stock. We have multiple voltages. We can ship them within a week once we find out what the voltage is. Um, they're chain driven. Uh, one benefit to our products over our competition is that we chain drive every one of our desk and dehumidifiers. So there's no belts that have a tendency to slip or to stretch um, or to break. So every one of our products is a chain driven desiccant wheel. The next product in our in our offering is what we call our rotor series. It's what we call our big brother to the compact series. Same concept. It's a standalone dehumidifier that has filters, desiccant wheel, heaters, and fans. Um, basic unit, but the the nice thing about this is it has a lot higher volume. So from 600 CFM all the way up to 30,000 CFM. Same concept, chain driven, uh, and one unique feature, the differentiating difference other than size between the compact series and the rotor series is we have the ability to do multiple reactivation heat sources. So electric, natural gas, steam, hot water. And then our final, our main uh, product series that, that we sell a lot of is more of a turnkey product. We call it our IDP series, stands for integrated dehumidification package that covers our entire gamut of volume of airflow. So from 75 CFM up to the 30,000 CFM uh, range. So these products is basically a turnkey solution where the customer is asking either you, the engineer, or us, the manufacturer, to come up with a turnkey solution that handles both temperature uh, filtration and humidity control for them. So that way they don't have to go to multiple sources to, um, to provide a solution for them. These are great for the lower dew point where, again, lithium batteries, you guys are familiar with the big push for electric vehicles now, uh, pharmaceutical production. Uh, it's a, again, it's a turnkey solution. All your coils, all of your condensing units, all of it can be like a single single skid, even controls. Give you guys a quick review of the kind of how we apply the IDPs. I told you it's the IDP stands for Integrated Dehumidification Package. Um, we allow the customer, the customer application is really what drives us to what components that we, we use within our dehumidifier. So I'll go through a couple of them just to give you a sense of, of why we use them the way we do. So we've got a pre-cooling coil. Again, we can use chilled water. We can use uh, DX coils. We can either remote mount the condensing unit or skid mount it. Um, the purpose of this pre-cooling coil component prior to the desk at wheel is to remove heat and moisture to allow us to get the low dew point that we talked about earlier. So. Uh, post cooling coil. Uh, post is reference that the coil is located after the desiccant wheel. Uh, post cooling coil, again, chilled water or DX. The whole purpose of this post cooling coil typically is to remove the sensible heat that is that byproduct of the desiccant wheel um, that we talked about earlier. So it's to provide either a neutral temperature to the space or the customer can come to us and say, hey, 
not only do we want you to control humidity in the space, but we want you to be able to control temperature in the space. Um, so in that case, we'd have to come up with a differential low enough to um, differential on the temperature and on the volume of air to provide uh, space temperature that they're looking for. Next item is, is very similar to the pre-cooling coil, but it's more of a preheating coil. It's typical for northern, uh, typical more for northern climates where the outside air is, is, is either the primary airstream or it's very, very cold. Um, we don't want air going into the desiccant wheel that's below, a, really it's 10 degrees Fahrenheit, but from a safety factor, we always say 20 degrees Fahrenheit. So in this situation, we'd want, we're taking, it's a DOAS system. I know we live in Atlanta, so it's not completely relevant, but uh, if we're taking a DOAS system in Fargo, North Dakota, um, we don't want negative 10 degrees Fahrenheit, you know, infiltrating the dehumidifier. Again, post cooling, post heating coil. Uh, if we have a process where it, they want to either heat again for northern climates or they've actually got a process where they may they may want 150 degrees Fahrenheit in the in the process. Typically, it's it's more or less a process application that we're using, not necessarily a room, but uh, post heating coils are used on a regular basis. And then filtration, another thing that we, we pride ourselves on is the ability to uh, in, incorporate filtration throughout our system, both on the outside air, return air, and even the final uh, leaving air. Uh, we can do MERV 8s all the way up to HEPA filters. And then dampers, uh, we have the ability to do either face and bypass when we're trying to control temperatures and humidities very tightly, or uh, a lot of it's just airflow balancing. We have the ability on outside air, return air, uh, those air streams to be able to control the airflows very tightly. And then finally, uh, even though we are a dehumidifier manufacturer, there are times where we need to be able to control the humidity in the winter. And again, in the Northern climates, it gets a lot drier than it does down here in, in Georgia. But there are times uh, where we have issues with static electricity if we're too low. So there are times where we actually add humidification for wintertime operations. Before I go on to the next, uh, next area of the presentation, any, any follow-up questions of where we're at so far? Yeah, there's a couple questions. Um, one, I think you kind of just answered it, but are the pre-cooling and post-cooling additional units when required? So I think you that was right before you went through all the coils that are that are being used here. Um, the next one is: Does the compact series have the post-cooling coil to release uh, neutral air to the room? So yeah, I apologize about the dogs. Um, so to answer your question, yes, the compact series can do a post-cooling coil. In doing so, it actually gets upgraded to the IDP series. So to answer your question, yes. Um, and then the other question was, are the pre-cooling and post-cooling additional units when required? Uh, any, can we elaborate on that one, Winston, by any chance? I like I said, that was right before you went through all these coils. Okay. So I think that you just answered that by saying that, you know, no extra equipment is needed um, downstream or upstream. It, it can all be packaged together. Okay. And then uh, there was an anonymous question that said, uh, can you, can you still use hot gas reheat coil if using DX? Um, I want to make sure I'm, I'm answering this correctly. We use hot gas to modulate the, uh, the leaving air temperature. Um, we don't use hot gas as a like a reheating coil um, at this time. It's something that that we've we've ventured into. You see that a lot in a commercial applications. Um, some of our competition does the condenser or the reheat coil, if, if you will. So
Uh, and then Don asked a quick question. Do you recommend a bypass feature? I assume, Don, if you want to chime in, you're more than welcome to. But uh, I assume you mean bypass as around the desiccant wheel. Is that accurate? Okay. So there's two reasons why we'd use bypass around the desiccant wheel. The first one is if we have a higher than normal um, dew point needed. So maybe that in between, so maybe a 30 degree dew point, there's times where we can bypass air around the desiccant wheel to mix and give us something, you know, maybe around a 20, 25, 30 degree dew point. The, the full technology of the desiccant wheel isn't really needed to give you 25 degree dew point. So we'll use bypass in those situations. And then the other reason we'll use bypass is you can actually control the leaving air dew point and the room dew point really, really precisely if you allow air to bypass around the desiccant wheel. So uh, there are situations where we have to control the dew point or the relative humidity to plus or minus half a percent relative humidity. And in doing so, we will use face and bypass to allow air to go around the desiccant wheel. Um, one, actually a third one is in the event we're controlling the temperature in the space as well, and that temperature load requires us to have maybe twice as much CFM for temperature control, there there will be a time where we'll actually just bypass around the desiccant wheel um, and mix that air in with the dehumidified air later. If, if that if that answers your question, Don. So, um, if that's all we have now. I'll, I'll continue on and we'll talk about the markets of where we apply our, our dehumidifiers to. So I'll go through these briefly. There's about 15, 14 to 13 to 15 of what we would consider our top markets. We're constantly, we're constantly finding new markets, like I was saying earlier, that, that are realizing the benefit of having dry air um, to help them with production, uh, reduce downtime, safety, product quality. So we'll go through these briefly. Uh, we got food processing, pharmaceuticals, laboratories, colleges, research facilities, electronics, automotive industries, hospitals, aerospace, and then we've got plastic injection, uh, military. We've got archival storage and museums. Uh, another one that's kind of fre less frequent is more like glass lamination. And then here recently with, with grow facilities, uh, those, are, those are becoming more prevalent throughout the country. So uh, again, if you guys have questions specifically on the application that we're working on, please, please feel free to jump in or, or post a question and we can have Tracy, Tracy stop me. Um, but let's talk about each individual one and how desiccant dehumidifiers uh, benefit that industry. So when I was younger, I would give, I would give laboratories as, as the number one uh, application for our product. But as I've been in the industry now for over 25 years, I would say food processing is the number one application. You'd be shocked. Uh, your salt, your sugars, your flours, um, potato chips, raw materials, wheat, uh, barley. It's just, it's one of those things that all of those materials, all of those components, all of those uh, raw materials just have a really high affinity for water. So uh, like seeds, for example, if you put water on seeds, they germinate. So we've got to keep seeds dry. Um, they also have an issue with clumping of, of material. Um, silos, uh, again, uh, keeping the, the product mold-free, mildew-free, and able to be transferred down a, a conveyor is, is really important. Uh, next one is pharmaceuticals. Uh, pill stamping. Uh, gel coating, you guys see now it's everything's about gel coating, uh, time release capsules that have a certain coating that, that don't get released until they get farther down, down your body. Um, and then pill powder, 
you guys know the BC headache powder, uh, you got their effervescence, whether it be Alka-Seltzer or that Airborne, all of that's manufactured in a low humidity environment for product quality and uh, product conveying. Uh, laboratories, this one is, is somewhat over overlapping for other industries. So universities, laboratories, um, those are somewhat overlapping, but most companies before they release a product, they actually do research testing on, on that product before they release it, they mass release it. And a lot of those laboratories actually partner with colleges. Uh, if you guys are familiar, University of Georgia has a, has a very prevalent agricultural field. Um, they actually have a lot of rooms, environmental rooms that are designated for long-term seed storage. The next one that is becoming a big com competitor, if you will, to, to food processing as, as kind of the industry to, to, to beat is electronics. Everything we have in our lives now is becoming more and more electronic, whether it's vehicles, semiconductor chip, lithium batteries, your, your phones, your computers, uh, everything has some sort of electronic component to it. And those electronic components typically are metallic in nature and metal, ferrous metals for sure have a uh, high affinity for condensation and when they do they rust their life cycle gets reduced dramatically uh the automotive industry paint booths um electronics assembly areas battery assembly plants engine testing some of the lowest dew points that we've ever done has been in the automotive industry so uh, a quick fact if you guys don't know Every major car manufacturer, before they release a vehicle to market, they life cycle that just about everything in that vehicle. And the biggest thing is engines. So when you are up in Anchorage, Alaska, or the Arctic Circle, and you want your Honda Civic to turn over the next morning, they have to be confident that when you press that start button or turn the key, they want that engine to be able to fire up. So they have these simulation labs up in up in Detroit and throughout the, the Northeast where a lot of these manufacturers are, they'll take their engines and put them in these simulation chambers where they're simulating the Sahara Desert or the Arctic Circle or uh, you know Denver, Colorado for elevation. And we have to simulate those conditions. So we've done negative 111 degree dew points, uh, which is unbelievably crazy. We've done it for Caterpillar where they were doing engine testing. Uh, hospitals, there's been a big push last probably five to eight years on hospitals where surgeons are requiring 60 to 65 degree temperatures at less than 40% relative humidity. And again, if you look at the psychometric chart, that is just below where the refrigeration systems can do it. So be on the lookout for customers, clients that, that have required started to make a request and uh, I forgot the industry uh, committee, if you will, I think it's ASHI, maybe the hospital industry that is driving this new requirement to have lower humidities in hospitals. Uh, next is aerospace. We don't have a lot of aerospace applications here in the Southeast or in in Georgia per se, but you do have Lockheed Martin, you do have some stuff uh, around. Again, they have low humidity environments that, that benefits them when they're manufacturing uh, either engines or they have labs where they're assembling these components. Another big one is plastic injection molding. Look around on your desk right now, I guarantee you there's something that has been injection molded, whether it be your cell phone case or your, your, uh, whatever it is, your, your lamp on your, your office, your scissors, whatever your, your computer speakers, your computer cases, 
all that stuff is is usually injection molded and they have issues where if they have humidity on the the mold itself you'll get something called splay where you get these like weird streaks on the the mold itself so you'll actually pump cool dry air over the mold and that increases product quality which therefore you know allows less downtime and increases quality and and uh and profits for the customer. Uh, another one, military. Uh, we have a lot of military both in long-term storage, uh, which we're going to get to here in a second, but uh, we actually did a project. You'll, you're actually looking at the new B-21 bomber in this photo. That B-21 bomber actually will not fly if it's in a very humidity and uh, laden environment. And what I mean by that is the electronics on that plane have to be in a low humidity environment or they have condensation issues where they have they have quality issues where they can't actually fly the plane. Um, we have four pieces of equipment that we just shipped to Palmdale, California, where they're housing the first, I think it's four to six of these pieces of equipment. Anytime these pieces of equipment are not flying, they actually pump cool, dry air into the, to the cockpit of these planes. Next application, uh, I was talking uh, earlier about this, is, is long-term storage for museums and libraries, uh, film storage. The, the industry is realizing that now that we're getting out of uh, the old school film, if you will, 35 millimeter, some of the rolling film uh, motion pictures, they've, they're storing them and they're actually degrading because they're not held in a lower humidity environment. So libraries, uh, a lot of the major motion picture industry companies are realizing that they need to store these old films and old uh, content in a climate controlled environment. Uh, mild, mild, uh, mold and mildew actually wreak havoc on the paper side of things. So uh, the Library of Congress, uh, there's one, the Ronald Reagan Library out in Southern California has desiccant on it to ensure that these books don't have uh, a shorter lifespan. Talked about it briefly. I don't know if there's a, an enormous need for it here in the Atlanta or the, or the Georgia territories, but glass lamination, uh, architectural buildings, um, and then bulletproof glass. Uh, if you have any issues where you're you're laminating the glasses together, you actually have issues. If you've ever seen a bad tent job on somebody's back window of their car where it bubbles, that's the effect of having moisture inside of that, uh, in between the, the film and the glass itself. And then the last major market I want to talk about is grow rooms. Uh, been a big push in the cannabis side of things, but give you a, just a quick 30 second pitch on on the concept of grow rooms and why desiccants are needed is we're synthetically or we're artificially creating an environment to grow plants quicker than it would if we let mother nature take its course okay so the concept of if we can grow these plants three times quicker than we would if they're outside why not? Why would we not do that? It's, it's more profit. We can cycle these through. Well, that means that we have to, to water these plants, you know, two, three, four times more often. And when you do that, you have to let the water come out of the plant. Well, you can't let it come out of the plant naturally because that takes too long. So we're artificially speeding up the process. And by doing that, we're lowering the humidity to allow that water to escape from the plant quicker. To, so it goes into the next next grow cycle. Um, kind of the, towards the end of, of the presentation, guys, what does Holden, what does Innovative Air Technologies need? What do we need from you? We need you to ask customers questions, you know, about their process. Typically, I would imagine that the, the customer is coming directly to Holden or to the engineer. But in the event they're not, 
asking them questions about moisture problems or condensation issues with their product. Um, could they be more efficient if they, they didn't have downtime due to uh, you know, USDA coming in and, and shutting them down because of condensation on their, their meat packing plant, whatever. Um, and then the, the next thing is we need, a, we need a lot of information. If you guys can get us these eight items, 95% of the time I can get some sort of a selection back to you through Holden and Holden can do it as well. We can usually get something back to you within a day. So room size, room construction, people, uh, what kind of conditions do they wanna hold in the space? What kind of conditions do they, do they have surrounding the space? What kind of services, utilities do they have? Um, project name, project location. So we can do some ASHRAE uh, selection for you. Uh, it's, it's very important. And then we can, you can find this link on our form. Uh, we've got a PDF form that Holden has that they can send to you or the link below. If you go to our homepage, dbitofires.com, uh, request a quote. It actually asks those exact questions um, of, of you. And then that comes directly to my inbox and we can, we can provide a selection for you. Um, quick benefits to innovative air technologies over what I would consider the competition. Majority of the time we're lower cost. Uh, we're very responsive. Holden can, can account to that. Um, we're attentive and relational. Again, we absolutely care that we're trying to enrich somebody's life. And we cannot do that if we ignore people's needs for, you know, for attention or solutions. Uh, we have lower lead times. COVID, you know, we're not exempt to the to the effects that COVID has had, but our lead times are, you know, 18 to 22 weeks, 24 weeks. Our competition's 46 to 55 weeks at times. Uh, we're very flexible. We want to be able to, again, enrich your life, and we don't want to be rigid. Some of our competition, they're not willing to, to like to work with people. So, uh, And then we feel that we're the only manufacturer of desiccant dehumidifiers that um, we would consider to be 100% American-made. So that's something that we'd like to, to bring to the table as well. With that being said, I'm, I'm about 42 minutes in. I like to leave the last couple uh, minutes for, for questions and dialogue and, and anything else that you guys can, can think of. So thank you so much for your time. If you guys have questions, I'd love to, I'd love to open it up for more of a question and answer session at this point.